see if this will actually send it up. It looks like we are online. Hopefully. Just gonna check this. Looks like everything's going up. Oh, we had a, a couple sitting sitting in the lobby. I like to see that. Sorry about being a little little late. I've been running around trying to get everything set up. So I'm glad that uh glad that y'all are here on this beautiful Monday morning in the States, uh, Monday evening elsewhere in the world. Uh, yeah, so good to see everybody. And it looks like we're we're moving along great. I hope y'all have had a weekend, a, a good weekend. Uh, yeah, it's good. Good morning, Saif. It's good to, to see you back on. And I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name right on that. One of our uh, returning viewers i know that you've been uh pretty involved with with everything um you had the the was it you that had the digital output in the s120 that you were trying to control your contactor with um i believe we did a whole a whole thing uh around that so yeah good to see everyone uh if you're not uh aware my name is jason watts uh i am Founder and CEO of a little automation company out of Alabama um, called Alpha Industrial Technologies. Got about, I don't know, 20 or so years of experience with Siemens drives and uh, PLCs. And yeah, so been doing this for a little while. If you're interested in Siemens PLCs or kind of general automation topics, you're probably in the right place. Um, trying to do some weekly content, weekly live streams. Uh, been a little lax on the edited content, but we got an edit, edited video coming out uh, pretty soon. Um, kind of introduction to um, introduction to Siemens PLCs and Portal and kind of all of that. And so, yeah, uh, if this is your first time here, welcome. Be sure to drop, uh, drop a hello in the chat and maybe hit that thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed, be sure to subscribe. Um, if this is not your first time around you probably know that this is mainly a drives channel and i was a uh, drives application engineer in the u.s for quite some time for a siemens distributor here in the u.s and um yeah so today we are getting back to our roots and uh i'm actually gonna start up a little bit of music it was requested that it not be so loud last time i apparently got the music a little too loud uh so i'll try to find the the old balance uh i can't i seem to like i don't have something going something like with a little beat i end up just rambling but, uh, yeah and so just imagine me rambling even worse than i do now <laughs> uh but anyway yeah so today we are going back to our roots the the s120 and honestly um had a couple of people kind of talk about um, this in a couple of different places, um, but there is a technology that might not be very well known to you if you are not very familiar with the Siemens S120 platform, and it is called DCCs. Um, and DCCs stand for Drive Control Charts. And honestly, it is a, I don't know if they try to keep it a secret or if it's just a little bit more advanced, but um, it's a way that you can program actual, like real logic, like similar to PLC programming on board a Siemens S120 uh, drive. And so if you're in a situation to where maybe you're a little bit more uh, restricted in cost on, on a system and you're not looking to put like a full-fledged CPU in and you're kind of, you're wanting to, you're needing to do that permanent magnet control, do some fancy stuff, but then not really um, have like a full blown motion control processor or, or, or a full blown processor on it. DCCs could be your fit. Um, I've also found a lot of different things to where uh, you will have, have kind of these, um, I guess, applications to where you need a little bit of control on the on the drive kind of like the the drive contactor control that that we were talking about before um 
but you don't quite want to be sending stuff back and forth through telegrams and stuff like that. Again, Siemens is known for their flexibility. So there's kind of a lot of different ways that you can, can go about this sort of stuff. But today we are going to talk about DCCs and I'll be honest with you it, about an hour ago, I, I found out that they have actually re released, um, DCCs into portal. Um, not sure what version they released it into. It might've been 17, but I don't have the software package or the uh, licensing for it. I have DC, a DCC license in starter. So for all you old school starter fans and uh, yeah, we get to go back to our love, our first love, our first programming environment that uh, was so good for so long. Um, and if you're not familiar, with what starter is is let me get it pulled up here um that's a big and let's kind of talk about this let me go over here so here is starter and I, as you can see i've kind of been already going through stuff so i'm going to delete out some of this these things because i'm going to go through and show you how to um to to kind of go from start from scratch you can see where I've been playing around with this. Again, it's been a little while since I have actually done uh, programming in this. Uh, so I had to go back and, and test a couple of things. And so I brought up an old an old uh, program that I had ready. It was I just had an S120 test. In, in this little program, if you're not familiar with Start Drive, um, I believe I have a couple of other videos where it really introduces you to the start drive functionality. Start drive is a free software package that can control any Synamics drive and the older MicroMaster series drive. So a lot of people aren't aware. It's not just for G120s, S120s, S1, like G150s, stuff like that. Uh, you can actually do MicroMasters as well. Uh, so the 420, 440s, um, which those are no longer in production, but there's probably hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of them out there, <laughs> if, if not more. So uh, Start Drive or Starter is a very, very powerful tool. If you're not familiar with it, it's very, very robust. And there's still some stuff in Starter that, that you can't do in Start Drive, which is the Tia Portal version of the drive package. Um, just some, the, like, for example, there's a, a fast Fourier transform, so you can get frequency domain analysis for all you nerds out there, uh, built into the, the starter package. I mean, you just trace a value and using the trace function, and then you can do an FFT on it and get your frequency breakdown of that function, which is really powerful if you kind of know what that is. And we might go into some of that later, but the, um, the best way to do those and show those sorts of things is with a, a real system, which I don't have, I have a control unit somewhere. Uh, and I thought I had it here at my apartment and I thought wrong. So I'm going to have to find that before we do anything really more advanced. But today I'm going to talk about DCCs, drive control charts. Um, and again, if you're joining in on the stream, um, uh, be sure to drop a, a Hey in, in chat just to show, show the love to the channel. Um, and if you have a question, feel free to just drop, uh, drop a question in there. You'll see me kind of looking over at the chat periodically. Um, and I will try to answer your question, um, in, in time, uh, for kind of, if it's a question about what we're talking about at that moment, yeah, I'll, I'll go through that. Um, cause this channel's for you guys. Uh, it is for, um, uh, dude, that's awesome. Brazil. Wow. Yeah. Uh, International crowd. I, I love that Siemens brings in the international crowd. And um, like, I love the fact that, that this channel out of, out of Atlanta in, in the U S can have so many different people that, that are coming in from, um, from all over the world at different times. So um, yeah, to my, to my uh, Western hemisphere peeps, like good morning, or I guess good afternoon. For Brazil, I mean, you're probably a couple hours ahead, <laughs> uh, but but yeah. So yeah, we're talking about DCCs today, and again, I kind of went over it. DCCs, drive control charts. Um, it's a little feature that 
is built into um, built into the S120s. And there's kind of a couple of different levels that you can, can go with it. Uh, DCC, you can do this. Um, you can use a, a sorry, a pre-made drive control chart without having a license. So if you have starter, um, if you have starter, you can go in and you can compile charts and you'll see here will be, it will be creating parameters on the drives, which is pretty cool. Um, and all you need in that is the starter program. If you want to go in and make your own charts, there is a, a license that you need for the editor, but you do not need to open the editor to compile a chart. Um, so, um, I just so happen to have a, a, a license for, for the editor, which if you have a license for, uh, somatic CFC, uh, the control function charts or sequential, I can't even remember what, what CFC stands for, but, but it's the same editor. It's Synamic CFC. Um, and it, it, if you have that license, it will cover your license for the editor on DCC. So you may already have it actually. Um, one thing about when you install starter, there are a couple of different options. And by default, the DCC editor is not checked. So if you are wanting to explore this, uh, you will need to probably go back in, reinstall starter and look for a little checkbox when it's selecting all of the options. Um, you're going to want to make sure that, that, uh, DCC, the DCC editor is uh, installed and it will install this, uh, CFC style editor. So, um, without too much more about it, let's just do this again. I've got a project that I've, I've got to drive in. It's got an S120. This looks like a CU320-2 DP. So this is actually the control unit that I thought that I had in, <laughs> in my closet uh, at my apartment, but, uh, alas, maybe, maybe next video. So I've got a drive that's in, um, that's already built up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this out. Um, and you'll notice here that under the object, you can create a DCC chart. And so we're going to just insert a DCC chart. Um, and said so project will be saved when DCC charts created. Uh, yeah, we want to do that and we'll just, my chart, we'll name it. Uh, and then it's going to open the editor automatically. And now, so if you do this and it opens up this editor or it comes into this, when it goes to open the editor, even if you don't have a license installed, you can go through and um, activate, I think it's a 14 day trial license. So you can play around with this. Um, you can play around with this without, um, without a license to see if it's going to be, it's going to work. And you'll be able to actually make some charts and be able to do whatever you want. So maybe you can kind of plan ahead and maybe use the trial period and get some, some good, uh, charts that you can compile later on once your, um, once your editor license expires. Um, so this first little screen here is, um, just seeing what base libraries you're wanting to use. Now, if you're familiar with kind of the versions of Synamics, you'll know that the new, um, the new CU320 hardware starts at version four and goes up and we're currently on like, I can't remember, it's like 5152. I haven't updated this, this version of uh, Starter in a while, so it may not be completely up to date. But what you are picking here is the libraries that you want to be able to be available to you in this DCC chart. Um, and we'll see what those are. We're just going to move over just the most recent, um, I guess that's not the most recent cause that's a five one one, but, um, we're going to use this one here and we're just going to accept that. And it's going to make this DCC chart and it's going to bring it up here in a second. Hopefully it brings it up. Nope. It didn't. It brought it up on this screen down here. So it brings up this window here. So 
a couple little things. This is might be your default view. Uh, this might be your default view. And so remember, these are drive control charts. So it's charts and uh, function blocks. And so you're going to have blocks and we're going to be connecting. And each one of these little panels here is a chart. Um, so let's, if you're in this, you can double click on here to bring into just that chart. Um, and a little overview, this area here in the middle, that's where we're going to be bringing in our blocks. Uh, the These kind of lines over here on the left, they are going to be... Um, they are going to be your uh, inputs and a little bit further over, they're going to be your outputs. Now, inputs and outputs in our world are going to be parameters on our drive. And so uh, you're going to be reading in like our parameters and you can output out and connect up to Bico parameters. Um, and so that's what these sides of this screen are. And we'll, I'll, show you all this with just a basic overview um so that library functions that that i started out with uh at the very beginning that's this is what's available to you here um is like adders like real type adders add integer type double integers all sorts of stuff um cosine functions and we're just going to kind of go through the basics of how to do it and we might I think I want to point out one, um, one, um, what's it called? Kind of more advanced block, but yeah, for the most part, there's a couple little tricks that, that we want to go through on this to make sure you really understand, uh, the basics of it so that you can start building stuff. Most of the time, if you're coming in, in here and you're just wondering what a DCC is, you're just wanting to maybe do some additions, kind of modify maybe a set point or something. You're wanting to put in an offset. So let's go through and just drag in an add, an add block. Real simple. Um, and we're going to kind of focus on, I'm just holding down control and then um, scrolling with my wheel to kind of bring in, bring in this. And I will say that the... Um, Uh, so S120 is an advanced, um, so I have a question here of, is, is an S120 an inverter or a soft starter? So an S120 is, um, I, if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings movies or books or anything, it, it's the, the one drive to rule them all. Like it's kind of the most flexible, most advanced, uh, drive system that Siemens offers. Um, it, if it can be controlled and and this is what i always told to told to my customers when i was a siemens uh application engineer um i'll tell them that if it can be controlled an s120 can do it so um the the s is considered or stands for system drive and some people will confuse it with a servo drive because it is the platform that can do your permanent magnet servo motors and it can do servo control uh, but it can also do really, really good control with um, uh, vector drives. So um, asynchronous uh, induction motors. It can do all of your um, reluctant motors. And yeah, so it, it can do absolutely everything. It can even do linear servo motors. So this, this platform, if you learn the S120, uh, it might not always be the most cost effective, uh, drive. Um, yeah, if, if it might not always be the most cost effective drive, but it will be able to do whatever you're wanting to do. Um, so yeah. And this DCC functionality, there's a lot more to it that I'll probably bring up later on uh morocco awesome that that's awesome uh, yeah so again the international crowd um i love it um yeah so these dcc charts there are different libraries that are available with different blocks and i'll show you later a, a more advanced one and there's actually a tool called dcb dcb studio to where you can make your own libraries and you can write in c plus plus 
C or C++, you can actually write code to run these blocks in on their DCC. So it's, it's really awesome. Um, so the first thing we want to do, like, let's, let's just take in and kind of understand because the, the concept behind these charts is that you're trying to connect them into some of the parameters on the drive. And ultimately we're going to be creating parameters, custom parameters on this, the S120 drive when we're doing this. If for example, we wanted a, um, a value that is connected to our drive that, that we can connect in, um, kind of the goal for this is we want to take in take in two values from um, from the 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 telegram and we'll just kind of play it by ear we're going to take in two values it's two real values and we want to um, output just going to add them together um, and we want that output to be able to be plugged into a parameter like a bico parameter if you're not familiar with what bico means it's a bit inner connector operator i believe is is what it is but it's a it's what siemens calls parameters that can be connected together in the drives not all parameters can be plugged into another parameter but there are some that like the output of uh, like your speed set point, there's going to be an R value and you can connect that into FICO parameters in different places. Um, and so we want to be able to do that. So the first thing we want to do is learn how to make a parameter. So if we go in and we just double click on, um, oh, you can use, you can use these DCC charts to actually control the drives. So by the end of, kind of if we have time and we get there if um we'll actually be doing showing you how that you might uh be able to add in like a um an additional torque so um i've there are a lot of different reasons why you would want to to add in torque into your control path um like for example like an inertia compensation so We'll, we'll be showing here in a minute, there's a block that actually calculates the inertia of a, a building a building up diameter of a, of a roll. And you can take that output, modify it a little bit, and then put it into to compensate for that additional torque that's required to spin up that roll as it gets bigger. So this, you could actually control completely a drive system with DCCs. Now, it might be really good for you and if it's in your plant that you're running all the time and you love it um, it'll work really well um, but there's not a lot of people that know how to use these things so uh, just a word of advice of yeah I, I have I have a lot of companies in the US that that there's a couple of them that that use these to, to kind of do their control um, and they do it intentionally so that the companies that that they buy their equipment um have to call them up and be like hey we don't we don't know how to work on this and they're like okay and then they'll log in and they're the only ones that know how to do dccs so if you are a programmer that's out there looking to be more flexible and to be able to help customers learning dccs is a way that might get you into a position to where you're the only one that knows how to work on some system that the company's out of business and so you become like big man on campus because you're the only one that knows how to fix the piece of equipment. Now, if that's a good thing, ugh, I don't know. So we've double clicked on this X1 input and we're wanting to make it to where um, we can make a parameter that we can program from our drive as this input. So there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. If we wanted to connect this in from the outside, we could go in and click right click here and enter connection to address. And we would be able to go through and select just like it would be a Bico. And we could go in and pick, let's see, a speed set point before 
the set point filter. Okay, that sounds like a good. Say we're wanting to create some sort of offset. Okay, so that's already a parameter there that is is there. And we just kind of hardwire it in. Well, let's go through and right click on that. Um, and let's delete that interconnection because we want to make this a little bit variable. Um, because we just, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. The, the, so, um, got a commenter talking, talking about how they use them for, um, for alarms. And yeah, one of the things about the alarms is, is there's special functions that pull the alarms a lot easier and you can kind of parse out the alarm messages before it even gets sent up to um sent up to the the higher level control system so yeah a lot of people use these for alarms um but yeah so let's look at this let's let's make a parameter um that will we can connect to so let's call this uh my first input okay and there's a little a little trick um that we are going to do and it is the at and then star so at or i guess star asterisk so at asterisk and then a number and i'll tell you a little bit about this at first so we're going to do this at asterisk 10 and it's going to be my first input and this is in the comment we say okay and then we're going to double click on this bring this over try not to cover it up make sure if i start covering something up uh like with my face like down here in the corner be sure to yell at me in chat and, <laughs> and tell me you can't see what i'm looking because i forget that my head's down here uh, so let's do this again. So at asterisk, we're going to do 11 this time. And then my, my second input. And we're going to do that. And then let's do this for the output. Let's do at star 12, my output like this okay and so this is the way that you designate that that kind of operand needs to be um needs to be published as a parameter and so we're gonna uh say well it's already saved so we're gonna go back to our uh starter now and we're going to, I just click on my chart, right click and go to accept and compile. You see it goes through in the compile window. You see it executed with zero errors and zero warnings. Now let's go to our expert list and let's talk about where these parameters are. Um, because there is a special block of parameters down at the very bottom and it starts at parameter uh, 21,000. And this is kind of all of your, your extra parameters. This is kind of your free space in your parameters. Um, and so as you can see here, we now have these three parameters here. Uh, my first input, my second input and my output. And we look at these and we use that star designation. And so now, now this block, we can connect this into this block out in our expert list. And so we can click here and just like, instead of kind of hardwiring it, we can kind of variably select it. And so now we can go in and set, okay, here's a speed set point after the set point filter. And then uh, a speed controller system deviation. These are just random. Uh, <laughs> these are just random things. I'm just showing you that you could go through and connect in, connect in parameters like this from the outside system in variable. So let's go back through 
and let's disconnect one of these. Whew. Excuse me. Uh, so my allergies have been, for some reason, going crazy today. Um, but so let's put this back to a zero. And let's go back into our chart. Because I want to show you a little bit of a difference. So let's change this X2, my second input. And let's remove that asterisk. Because the at symbol will still publish the parameter, but it'll publish it as a parameter and not a bico. Let's see what the difference of this is. Go back here. We're gonna right click, accept and compile. We go back into it and now you can see the difference is instead of a bico parameter, which is connecting another value from somewhere else in the drive, we're now actually expecting an input like uh, 10.0. And so that's the difference between a parameter value, which is with the at, or the at star. So remember, at star makes it to where you can connect another parameter to it, like uh, our speed set point. And then if you don't have the star, it's not going to be blue. It's going to be green. Okay. And all outputs, outputs of blocks are always going to be R values because you can't change the value of that output in the block, except if you are using the block. I hope that makes sense. So now we've got this little adder here. And the way we have it set up right now is we've got the drive set point after the filter and we are adding 10 to it. Now, it's up to you to understand if that actually makes sense to do. And so that's kind of where the little DCC charts can get a little bit eh, iffy, is if you don't fully understand what that R62 value is, it maybe it might not be the best thing to, to do. One thing I will show you, um, because that value, that R62 needs to be of the same type as that input. So let's just click in that the parameter column and type 62 and let's go to that parameter, right click on it and go to parameter help. And it'll bring up this little value here. And so what we see is in this help file, it is a floating point 32 type. So it is a, a real value. Remember, it, the float is an old hardware programmer's version of saying a, a real. So those are the same thing. So float and real are the same. And so that's why this is available to us is because it's a float value. Now, if there's another value that is an integer, uh, let's see if I see any on there that that are integers. Uh, so there might be some that, that are integers. Most of them aren't. I'm just looking and seeing if there's like decimal points on them. If it's got a decimal point, then it's not going to be, uh, okay. Here's a, here's an integer, I believe. So if we go here, yeah. So that is an unsigned 16. That means that that is going to be a 16 bit unsigned integer. So, um, zero to 32,000, whatever. Um, and so that value would not be available to put in to our, uh, tag. So let's, let's just to prove a point and I might prove myself wrong here, <laughs> but let's go down and try to put our, 296 into this value. Uh, so let's click here, scroll all the way down to the bottom. And here, let's try and find 296. Our 296 is not available in this list. So I'm, I'm so glad that that worked out. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that integer, unsigned integer value is not a valid input for this. So Let's keep that 296. Y'all, y'all, y'all remember 296, uh, R296, R296. And 
I'm going to, I'm going to go into our charts now and let's bring in a, an ad, an integer type here. And let's do this at star, uh, 12. Two ninety six. <laughs> I have a terrible goldfish memory, so I'm going to publish that parameter just to kind of prove this point that you need to keep up with this. Um, accept and compile. Uh, found several times. Whoops. I must have. Oh. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I accidentally. That's an improvement. It used to not tell you that. So you have to kind of keep up with the fact of how many of your values you are. Uh, so what was that? What was that parameter value that we were wanting? So let's do the accept the compile. 290. What? Oh, I wish it was a joke. 296. I'm going to pretend. So my int input, let's see if 296 is available in here. I hope it is. Oh, uh, it's not. So apparently still not the right data type for 296, or it might not be available at all for not all values are available in this chart. But you can still there, see there are a lot more valuables, values that are uh, accessible there. Just trying to trying to point out the type that, um, or the fact that, um, yeah, you're you're wanting to match the types, and there's specific types of block blocks that are for integers or reals. So that's the basics of just kind of these blocks. Now, let's, I don't know, let's get rid of this thing. Yeah, just delete it. And let's do like a multiplier for some reason, because I want to show you multiplier real type. Let's drag this over into here. I want to take this output. And I'm just going to drag this over into here. And so you're just interconnecting the blocks that way. And now if I wanted to have a variable input let's have a a um an at 13. so that's going to be a parameter an input parameter uh my multiplier and then let's publish this At, that's going to need to be 14. The only bad thing about this is you're having to like keep up with these parameter numbers and what these I'll show you, I'll show you something as well, because showing you the basic operations, and then we're going to get into a couple little bit more details. So we do that, go back to starter, right click, accept and compile. Cool. And stuff has changed. So we've got our first input, second input, the output from the adder. Want to multiply. And then there's your product. So all those things. Now, why would you need that output? Maybe, maybe you don't need that addition output. You don't have to publish parameters for them to work. Um, so we can just go into not that one. Uh, we don't have to have this here. Okay. And these don't also don't have to be in kind of sequential order. So let's kind of do this. Oh, good there. Now we'll go through and look now. Our output is now gone, but all of that multiplication and product and everything like that'll all work. You're just deciding what 
you want to actually be published out as a parameter. And so that's, that's kind of what we are doing with that. Um, so what I've done here, when I change that to a 140, then that is going to be, um, it, it, if you notice, it's actually an offset. So that number starts at uh, 21, I guess 21, so 10, so 21,500. So 21,500 is the first parameter of those parameters in your offset. And I wanna say, I'm going off script now. I wanna say that's defined somewhere. I don't know if it's here. Um, yeah, but there is a place to define that. Um, I have a, I have a document here that I'm using and I will link here. Let me send because let's see. Oh, wow. you, you're not seeing that. Uh, so I have a document that I, that has all of these functions and everything on here. Uh, and yeah, it kind of goes through how to compile all these things and notes about um, the at and the star. There is a, a document that, that Siemens has put out and it's called the uh, DCC Editor Description Programming and Operation Manual. And I will, I actually, let me link that. Let me get the, um, let me get this bottom right. Let me get a link for this. Cause and let me put this document's report ID in the chat. And if you're not familiar with how to do, like if you go to, not that one. It's up on the screen. So if you go and take this, uh, go to the Siemens support website, support.industry support.industry.siemens.com and in the little search bar you search for that number i just put in the chat um, and search for it it will pull up directly the uh article that's for that this document that i, I that i'm using so that's a little shortcut trick um so yeah so we'll go back to to what we're talking about here. And again, if you have any questions about like what we're talking about, uh, let me know. So we have a little basic program here, but there's a couple of little things that we need to talk about um, before we can actually execute this code on the processor. Um, you have to set up what is called uh, a runtime group. And if you notice, you notice that 21, 21,000 parameter is talks about the runtime group properties. Okay. And that's kind of the start of all the extra stuff. Um, there's some free blocks that are, you don't have to use DCCs. You can call them like DCC lights. It's like adders and or functions and and functions. They show up above the 21,500 but uh, below the 21,000 because they're all, they're all controlled by these runtime group properties. And so what we want to do is, even if you're not using DCCs, if you're using the free blocks, you have to have a knowledge about these, um, these runtime groups. So uh, let's look at it from here. And I guess um, we can select a lot of different runtime groups a lot of different runtime groups now what what in the world does this actually mean so let's go through and 20 2102 is the basis sampling time of the cpu or of the cu so if you want to run this thing as fast as possible which you may not want to uh, you would want to just set this to one. So this is going to be runtime group 
uh, it's one time the basis sampling time. So I don't actually have any hardware connected up. And so depending on how the, the hardware is actually selected, this base sampling time for the hardware is going to be, um, it's going to be variable. So if, if for some reason your hardware is running slow, some functions are enabled and it's running slow, you're not going to kill your processor if, because it's keeping up with that basis sampling time and that's updated continually. So we've done that. And so we're just going to say, run this stuff as, as, as fast as possible. Um, let's go back into the editor real quick and look at a thing uh, that up here at the top, uh, yeah, so up here at the top, we're gonna click on this run sequence button and we're gonna go in and look, first of all, we have to determine what order everything is because just like we're having to determine like how fast things are going, we want to make sure that all of our uh, charts and everything are updating appropriately. Because you might have a lot of like one through 10 adders over here and you want all of those additions done first and then the next level uh, is connected up. So you might have something that, that looks, oops, let's go back to, go back to this, not this. Un with that box, we want that. So we might have some sort of function to where it's, we have another adder here and this output connecting in, something like that, okay? Uh, don't know what that is. Oh, because <laughs> I, I had connected this, let's do this. Let's delete this line. Make sure that that's still connected. Yep, cancel. And then so into that. Yeah. Okay. So, so we've got these two things here. Well, by default, it's going to execute in numerical order. Numerical order being one. You see that block number is one, two, three. Well, that's probably not how you want this thing to actually execute if this was intelligent code instead of just random stuff that we're doing here. So you would want to come here and you would want to say, okay, my block three needs to be above block two, right? Um, and so that execution There we go. You have to drag it down. Apparently you can't drag it up. Don't know why, but so that way it goes, it executes one, it evaluates three and then evaluates two. Okay. Now kind of going back to our blocks. What's one again? What's two? What's three? I have, I have no idea. So probably the better way to do this. Let's go back to this is let's go and name these intelligently. So let's say adder one, name it, adder two, and then multiply. So now when we go back to the screen, it makes sense. And so, Again, going back to taking the time to just going through and like naming things when you bring in blocks, name them something that makes sense to you and that will make sense later. Because if, if we were to execute it like this, it would not, like you could easily see here, oh, hey, my adders aren't, <laughs> aren't right. And so I want to swap it up like this. So the last thing on here, I believe is I want to go and look at from the DCC chart view, talking about the execution cycles. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and if I have to remember it, where it is. Uh, 
view, debug, nope, options. I thought it was here. Where's that block? Um, I thought it was there. Hold up. Because there is a place where you can go through and actually like set the execution of these blocks. Set execution. Huh. Hold on. I may have to look it up real quick. Setting, sampling time. Here, I'll show you what I'm looking at. This is this block here. Uh, you want to highlight, highlight in the project menu and set the execute. DCC you want is highlighted. Okay. Again, sometimes we're all learning, <laughs> but we're learning together. Um, it said here. That doesn't make sense. What am I missing? Let's see what we're missing here. That's pretty, pretty sad. Sampling time for execution group is always set. And then starter, DCC one is highlighted in the project navigator. Oh, I should just read. It's always set in starter. <laughs> right click, set execution groups. Uh. So here's the here's the better version of of that little parameter. Uh, so right now the default looks like it is going to be a quarter of a millisecond update time. Um, and so we're going to scroll down to this other ah here scroll up to this other thing, and we we're kind of talking about before how you could actually do drive control. Um, so we're going to look at tying in something and kind of giving you a little bit of a thought of what you can do with these DCCs, um, is you might want to make sure that your speed controller is updated with this speed. Okay. Or the position controller is updated with this position. Like you're modifying the position or something and you want to make sure that the uh, position controller is updated. And so if we were doing that, we would say before position control. And so it looks like it's going to update every two milliseconds. But what it will do is it's just saying, all right, it's going to guarantee to be updated every two milliseconds. But it's going to make sure that before the position controller is executed, your block is going to be executed as well. And so that's what these that chart is. And so if you go through and add in another one, you can select a different execution group and you can change this change this on the fly like that. So you might have one chart one chart that is for like the uh speed controller for example or you're wanting to send some um like like y'all were using um in in your system in Morocco there um you might want to update it before the send PZD. So before you send anything out, you want to update all the alarms. You want to make sure that everything's sent out at the right time uh, into your telegram. So you could do that as well. So, yeah. So, but what we'll do is we will just select this T equals uh, 2102. And if you notice, if you're, if you have a, a keen eye, you could see over on this side over here that it's actually this value that I'm changing here is actually this parameter uh, 2100 index zero. So it's actually that value that we messed with before. It's kind of the default for the chart. So, uh, so yeah, well, we could just set this to, to that. If you don't set that runtime group, you can do all of those code. You could do all of that code. You could set everything up. You can have all your parameters, all their parameters connected and nothing will happen because it doesn't know where to set and actually run that code. It would be kind of like writing a function block in your PLC 
and then never calling that function block in ob1 or in a call that's being called in ob1 it never actually gets executed so that's what you're doing here and honestly that's really the basics of it in terms of like here's how to do the stuff interconnecting blocks connecting and getting a value out from the system like we talked about um and pulling it in from this side like over here um that's like pulling in a value like a system time or a speed set point and and you know that you need this speed set point every time you can just click interconnection to address and then bring it in and it will connect in over here on the side so that's interconnecting to an address uh publishing a parameter is what you have to do is you have to use the at the at symbol and if you want it to be able to be connected to something like um like a bico you want to be able to plug in uh you want to be able to kind of configure it without using the editor you use the asterisk so at asterisk the parameter you'll be able to exchange and you'll be able to plug in another value into that parameter if you use the asterisk if you don't it will be considered just kind of a uh a parameter value so you just get to pick whatever value and you have to type it in um like for example like the the motor the motor rated power is a parameter you cannot change that with a like the telegram information so if you're familiar and you kind of deep knowledge you know there is a way to change parameter values using acyclic uh communication and if uh yeah if you don't know about that and you want to learn more i did a live stream uh talking about or we talked about that i think in the last live stream about sinopera or maybe it was the one before but yeah there's a live stream talking about sinopera and it is a block that you can actually write parameters from your PLC. And so even if you didn't use the asterisk, you would be able to use that block on your PLC to change a parameter. So interconnections, publishing parameters, making custom parameters, and going through and connecting up blocks with your lines, things like that. Uh, and then your execution times. Those are really the, the big setting those execution. Oh, I guess the, the fourth one would be ordering, ordering what order your blocks actually execute in and then getting the, the processor to actually execute. So any, if you have a question right now, just kind of about these basics, uh, now would probably be a good time. Cause I'm going to show you a, a little bit kind of, get you thinking about what you could do with this because I don't know about you, but um, being able to execute code in a quarter of a millisecond uh, seems pretty good. I mean, to 0.25 milliseconds, uh, 250 microseconds, that seems pretty good. And so there's some things that you can do because even the fastest like profi net connection the fastest profi net connection you're not going to be able to update from plc go through the profi net and then update processor it's going to be on the order of a of a couple of milliseconds uh at, at best it's going to be like two milliseconds or something to be able to to send that data back and forth um think on some of the higher end processors you can you can get that that isochronous communication down to like half a half a millisecond or something but <laughs> those are expensive processors you can get quarter of a millisecond processor speeds uh for free well i, I guess not exactly free because you to write the charts uh you're gonna need a license and unless you can write them all in the uh, in the trial license period, or figure out some way to use the trial license period forever, uh, then you're going to need to buy a license. Um, before I went on here, like in the U.S., that license um, 
Let me pull that up because I did pull that up. If you were interested in that, the the license list price I think is like around six hundred dollars or so uh, in the U.S. I don't know what that would be in your region, um, but you can find it on the iMall. Uh, it's called uh, Synamics uh, DCC. I'm bringing it up over here and I'll buy nah. <laughs> Gotta spell it right. <laughs> I'm all does not like pulling up parts that are spelled wrong. So if you search in Siemens I'm all for Synamics uh, DCC, you will find um, a couple of different options. And there, uh, there's one, it's uh let's see i will put this in the chat this is the part number for the license and again in um so that is a floating license and so you can transfer it back and forth and list price is 271 dollars and 22 cents in the u.s um, depending on how much your distributor, if you're watching this from the U S depending on how much your distributor loves you, um, uh, that's probably going to cost you about 500 bucks or so. Um, but if you have a, I think I mentioned this before, if you have a, um, uh, somatic CFC editor license, then that will also work because this is just the CFC editor for um, like somatic CFC. So if you're used to using CFC like in step seven, like version five, six, something like that, you already got access to this. So um, yeah, so good thought there. So let's go through and maybe get an idea because we've had these like fast cycle times. I wanna show you some of the stuff that, that actually is available in here let's open up this these technology blocks and i mentioned uh kind of like winder blocks well we were kind of talking about a moment of inertia and if you're not quite familiar with drive systems um there is i guess a couple of things that in order to control a, a a drive system so say you have some sort of roll or something that you're trying to trying to spin um, and the two things that you're kind of trying to overcome well I guess a lot of different things that you're trying to overcome two of the main things that you're trying to overcome kind of what your acceleration torque is and then whatever torque is brought in externally from your system. Well, so the torque that is a part, say if I have a fixed roll, and um, like I said, it, you have a, a fixed part that's a roll like this. If it goes to spin, this thing, this part of this roll is never gonna change. So. To accelerate this roll, it's going to take a certain amount of torque. And that's just the inertia of the system. So inertia is a system's desire to not accelerate or not decelerate. So it's the resistance to change in speed. Okay. So in order to change speed, you have to add in or subtract torque. Um, so you have a positive or a negative torque. So inertia, if you, you can, let's look at it in the, in this little system here, uh, speed controller. So our speed controller here is outputting a torque. So what it's doing is you're sending out a speed set point and saying, Hey, I want to run at a hundred RPM and it's going back and either through an encoder or a calculation and saying, I am only running 10 RPM. What do you want me to do? And you have your controller, your speed controller, 
you have your speed controller that will um, say, okay, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to output this much torque. That's how much torque I'm outputting in order to match my speed. Well, there's technically, I guess, three components to what this torque is. You have your accelerating torque that it's a fixed accelerating torque. That's what it is. You have your friction torque you have to overcome. So this, this pulley has a certain amount of, let's do it this way. There's a hole, <laughs> a certain amount of, uh, amount of torque that inertia for it, but the bearing inside of it might start going bad. And so all of a sudden it increases the torque because it, it's getting friction on it. Uh, the maintenance guy, he didn't grease this bearing. And so all of a sudden you start pulling more and more torque just because the bearing's bad. Well, the PI controller has no eye, no idea about what's downstream. All it knows, um, uh, oh, awesome. Yeah. So DCC, if you have a license, this stuff is awesome. So, yeah. So as we're talking about this system, um, uh, as we're talking about this system, it will, those things will change, but the PI controller doesn't actually know anything about it. All it knows is, Hey, you're telling me to run hundred RPM and I'm only running, um, I'm only running 10 RPM. So I need to output some torque and it comes back. All right. How fast are you running? Oh, I'm only running 11 RPM. Well, good night. Why aren't you going faster? Here's some more torque. And, that, and that's essentially what this, this PI controller is doing. And depending on how you have it set up, depending on how angry it gets. <laughs> and so sometimes these PI controllers can get very angry and output really high torques because they don't understand that uh, maintenance gym, gym and maintenance didn't, didn't grease this bearing. And so there's friction there. And it also doesn't understand that that role has... Um, it's a very, very like big roll and it's, it, it's say it's got tungsten on the outside of it or lead. It's a lead lined pipe or something that it's spinning. And so all the inertia is on the outside. The PI controller doesn't know that. All it knows is it's not spinning fast enough. So it needs to output more torque. Well, there are some things that are called inertia and friction compensation. So if you have a fixed inertia and you know, hey, this role isn't going to change very much. Um, you can go ahead and say, hey, in order to accelerate at a certain rate, you are going to need this much acceleration torque. And you can do that. You're, you're an engineer. You can go through and do the calculation and you can figure out, figure out what that would be. Uh, well, you can also say, hey, there's this much friction on it because I can't do anything about it. Like you can go through and calculate like sliding friction and bearing frictions and things like that. And so inertia and friction compensation will go ahead and feed in a torque at, if you were trying to accelerate at a certain rate. And so you will hear it called feed forward control or uh, torque pre-control or inertia compensation. So those are all the same thing. It's taking and saying, hey, I know the baseline for this system and I know how much torque it takes to accelerate this little, this roll. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and feed it in. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. You do have, um, you do have some um, feed forward control in your S120. But for the most part, I don't have it. I don't have the extended set point channel enabled right now. But you can see here's this M pre control or N control. So our torque pre control, that's this path here. And so right now it doesn't have anything, have anything hooked into it, but we can go back. Okay. So let's look, let's look at this little thing here because we're clicking here. This is the output of our speed controller, which the output of the speed, there's, if you're 
if you've done calculus and you've done the math part, you're going to be taking the derivative of this. The output is going to be torque. It's going to be accelerating force. Um, and so we've done this and that's going to be this, this output here coming in on this path. Let me get this down and let me get my, my stuff. Sorry, I forgot to bring up my pen. Try to give a little bit of technical knowledge, a little bit of mentoring type stuff. So, uh, but yeah, I'm, it's great to hear that, that we have some people that are getting some information about this, these technologies. Um, and yeah, if you have specific questions about DCCs and, and things like that, be sure to be asking about them. Uh, because yeah, that's what this is for. Let's bring this down here and let's see if I can get this drawing. Ugh. Sorry. Sorry for your ears. All right, let's go to this. Ugh. Is my face in a good place there? Uh, let's say. Let's do this. Is that better? There we go. My wife always says my head my head's too big. So I'll make it smaller. Now tell her. Tell her my head is not too big. <laughs> uh so anyway, so let's moving on. Uh, our speed controller is coming in here. And this is the the kind of the the path that doesn't know anything. Uh, it it doesn't understand what is in the system. All it knows is the system isn't going really fast. So this is like the the angry uh, <laughs> the angry input, and we want to keep that input as less angry as possible. And so if we know on top that we have a a roll that is lined with something that's going to have a certain amount of inertia uh we we can calculate how much um, torque it's going to take well this pre-control here is siemens way of going ahead and giving you a little bit of control over it and say hey how much inertia do you have here and how much um how much do you want to compensate for it and so uh, let's clear that out right there. And then let's click on that. And we're going to go into this pre-control thing. So you can see right now, you can see right now the pre-control is just flat. So let's click on that and let's give it something. I don't know. Let's just give it a hundred percent. And so now you can see that Oh, hey, there's some sort of pre-control. It's kind of turned on. Well, you have this motor moment of inertia that I think in this system, it might be um, it might be just built into into it because it's got a, um, a what's it called? A, a permanent magnet motor in it that's got it already knows what's there. It, it knows the the inertia of it. Otherwise you'd have to put that in and then you can say, Hey, if I know my roll moment of inertia is actually in this case, uh, 20, 28.4, uh, pound feet squared. And I'm sorry for the Imperial units. Um, uh, but, but then if you know that it's 10 times the motor inertia, then you can just put 10.0 in there. And what it will do, and you say close, what it will do if we kick, click there, it will actually insert in that amount of torque into this path. And it will go and it will get put in and get set into the, uh, into the uh, torque limitation, eventually into the current controller. 
why does that matter because remember we have we have like our angry our angry controller here and it is trying it does not care about what it's trying to do it's just trying to accelerate well if we go and output if we do this calculation here in the pre-control exactly right then this will be pretty stinking close to zero it just won't even have any the only thing that it will have will just be either torque that's from friction torque that's from um oscillations in the system torque that maybe there's i don't know there's extra buildup uh on the roll like it's just things that we didn't account for that's what our angry controller is is actually uh compensating for and so anytime because the thing about it is like you can get into a situation to where this is outputting essentially 100 percent all the time so you're getting a hundred percent all the time and at that point it has no control over anything and so it might as well not be there because you're just outputting a hundred percent now if you ever get in a situation like that most likely what's happened is you've undersized your motor or there's some sort of mechanical blockage breakage uh break holding up but if if that sort of thing happens yeah you got you probably got bigger problems um a lot of times what will happen here is if you have like a little motor with like a like a 200 to 1 gearbox and it's like connected up to like this really big flywheel motor well you can spin it up and it will eventually get going um uh, <laughs> yeah so so it'll eventually get up and get moving and what happens is like during that time if you're not using pre-control your speed controller will just be completely maxed out and it doesn't at that point it doesn't have any control because if your foot's on the gas like a hundred percent in in your car you, you don't have any throttle control and I, it and like you really feel that in like a motorcycle uh if you if any motorcycle riders out there like if you're a hundred percent on the throttle then you're along for the ride if you have a little bit of control over your throttle then if you're going into a turn and you're leading into a turn then you can actually control the lean of the bike with with that throttle um but yeah if you're wide open you you don't have any control and so a really big inertia and so and there's this is a, a really big topic just in and of itself a really big inertia um you have to have inertia compensation here so for something like this for example um you might need say 90 percent um, of your of your motor torque to be able to accelerate at that rate okay and say that is 100 uh, newton meters of torque is 90 or I, why would i do that say 90 percent uh is equal to 90 newton meters of torque and that's what it takes to accelerate this really big load. Okay. So you've got this like belt going over this big flywheel and it spins up, spins up, spins up, spins up, spins up, spins up. Well, what you would want to do is set up to where when it's trying to accelerate, you have 90% coming here and essentially zero coming in from here okay so let's 
so we've got <clears throat> this situation to where if we know that that value or we can at least figure it out pretty well um then we can we can go through and make this happen um one way that you can do it is kind of the the testing method because if you have a fixed inertia this you want this value here to be zero okay and so what you can do is you can go through and trace and you can trace uh this value right here which is what is that parameter four, 1480 i'm like covering it up yeah 1480 come on it's 1480 so you could you could trace parameter 1480 and you could slowly uh, up in this pre-control value you could slowly up this parameter so parameter 342 you could go you could start it off at one to one and then you just, while it's accelerating, give it a 10 second ramp or whatever, or a 30 second ramp. And while it's accelerating, you look at that R uh, 1480 and you go through and say, okay, it accelerated, it, it tapped out at 90%. So that's not nearly enough pre-control. And so you go through, start it off at one, you say, okay, well, I'm going to see if it makes any effect at going to one and a half. And then you say, okay, which if you get more experience into it, you can know, oh, hey, this is going to be like 10 times or 20 times or, or whatever. Um, but the first time you do it, you say, okay, I'm going to put one and a half times in here. And you look at the effect it has on that 1480. Well, now the next time it might only 1480 might only be um, uh, 85%. And you say, okay, I'm making progress. Okay, cool. Well, then you stop it again. You say, all right, that gave me 5%. So I feel confident in maybe going up to three times. Okay, that's a significant jump, but it's not an order of magnitude. Um, so you go to three times and it ends up, you run that trace again, you accelerate the load up. And now that 1480, that output is only... Uh, say it's only 50%. And so you're like, okay, I'm getting there. All right. So, and you keep slowly upping that up and up <laughs> six hours. I don't know if my voice can last for six hours. Uh, but yeah, so the, uh, this stepping through, just slowly stepping through, uh, will eventually you will get this value here. Um, <laughs> you will get this value here down to zero or pretty close to zero. It may not always be zero. Um, and which now that I'm going back and thinking about it, the, is there kind of will always be something there in order to keep the load going. And one, one way that you can figure out what your target for this is, is let it get up to steady speed, steady state, and and just kind of let it sit there and run for a little while, and then just hit the record. And whatever this value here is for, at, while it's at steady state, that's going to be the best you're going to be able to get by this feed forward uh, thought process here. So you're, you've eked this value up on this big flywheel application. And what happens is um, now when you go to accelerate, even if you accelerate, try to accelerate a little faster uh, or a little slower, it will automatically compensate for it. And while you're accelerating, this value will be as low as possible. It might be say like one or two Newton meters as where, where it was before it would have been 90 Newton meters. Like if you didn't have any inertia compensation. So that's, um, 
that's what we have that's what we have the possibility of doing and there's kind of built in here in this pre-control right well that's for a fixed inertia so fixed inertia a big old flywheel you can pretty easily compensate for that just using the built-in tool so the torque pre-control um, built into the s120 if you're using by the way this same thing is available in the uh, dcm so your dc masters so the the 6ra80s um, same process a little bit different parameter numbers but all of this stuff is there and maybe at some point somebody can convince me to to go through and do it on there but i actually learned this whole process of of learning how to do inertia compensation on a uh, 6ra80 dc master and um so there's some there's some i guess principles that that aren't based on um what drive you're using and inertia compensation is something that is universal and so even if you're read even if you're watching this and you're you're not familiar with siemens drives and say you use like um, abb drives or yaskawa drives or, or whatever if they have a way to do feed forward control or inertia compensation this process of kind of slowly looking at the output of the speed um out of the speed controller and trying to get that down to whatever it is at steady state then that's going to work on abb alan bradley yaskawa it's bishy uh, Dan Foss, uh, Eaton, <laughs> anybody, anybody's drives out there, as long as they have a way to do this, it's the same process. Um, so that's with a fixed inertia though. So what happens if we have a situation where we have, do I have this pulled up? Uh, where we have a situation where we have a, a sheet going into a center feed winder and we're feeding a sheet in to this winder and we are rolling up a roll well as it gets bigger the inertia gets more and so what happens in a winder type application is the inertia when you start your wind is something different than when you stop your wind. So anytime you go to start and stop a system, you are going to encounter this inertia. And this inertia compensation is fixed. And so it doesn't really help you much here. Um, and so in the world of winding applications, um, you have these um, diameter calculations and uh, inertia calculators. And guess what? Guess what is available in DCCs? Those two very things. You have a diameter calculator for a winder and then a inertia calculator for a, a cylinder. So built in built into the core functionality are, are these two blocks. And we're gonna take a look. And if you don't quite understand why that that's important is any type of acceleration, inertia is the opposition to any acceleration. And when you are slowing down, you are applying a negative acceleration. So all acceleration is the same. All acceleration is um, has to be, um, is fought against by, by the inertia of the system. And so in these winding rolls is you have your system tuned right on the start of the winding, but then once it gets built up into this big roll and it's sitting there spinning, it's like having a big flywheel. And all of a sudden your inertia compensation doesn't have nearly enough inertia and it starts shaking as it's trying to slow down. And that's because you're angry your angry, uh, your angry speed controller is having to do all the work. And so that's why it's sit, sitting there and you'll hear it as vibrations. Um, and so there's only 
kind of a couple of different ways if you're not using inertia compensation you you end up either having this long like if you're trying to start up a a flywheel it'll speed up and then it'll you'll hear it and because it's trying to your gain value has to be really low and so it'll go up and down and up and down and it'll take a minute before it finally gets like balanced into where it needs to be now once it gets up to speed everything's nice that's with a low proportional gain value if you don't want it to wallow like that then you have to up the gain well what happens is upping the gain makes your 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 speed controller more and more irritable <laughs> that's the only way to put about it and on a big flywheel when you up your p gain all of a sudden uh at steady state you will hear vibrations all the time you will hear a whining you'll hear almost like a grinding and it will wear out components it'll wear out components bearings on your motor it'll wear out belts chains anything that your gearboxes whatever because it's sitting there trying to fight and correct and because that p controller is or that speed controller is so angry it's it's all over the place so you want to keep that p gain as low as possible while still um while still maintaining control and if with a fixed inertia system it is simple as just doing inertia compensation and because it's all about the acceleration the only reason you up the gain in the first place was because of the wallow um and what's crazy about these systems is um the speed Speed. If you have a perfectly like controlled um, or perfectly balanced um, inertia compensation, your acceleration or your speed when you go to accelerate will literally look like this. It'll just dunk, it'll hit it perfectly because that's that's like what your set point goes up slowly and then it. All right, you're at your set point. So there's your ramp and at your set point. Whereas with a P controller or a PI controller, it's going to have a lag and then it's going to come up and probably have an overshoot and do something like that. Yeah. Lou said, man, you're, you're cutting, cutting to it, man. <laughs> Lucid, Lucid's jumping the shark on, on, uh, on the, there is an adaptive, there's adaptation as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, that that you could do that at higher speeds you have a lower gain and i, I guess i'll show y'all that i mean if i have to but inertia compensation is so much funner <laughs> and funner is a word isn't that right lucid we're from we're from alabama funner is a word uh so adaptation the so lucid brought up adaptation uh so you have your p gain your reset time, so your integral gain, and you can actually adapt them. Get out of here. Um, to where, at a lower, at a lower speed, um, at different speeds, you can um, have different values. So here, your adapt, your scaling, scale upper adaptation speed is. If you're not familiar with these, like. Uh, control charts they can get a little annoying um but yeah so we trace through and you can see how um at your upper limit this is set up to where it is 100 percent of your p gain because what you would want to have is less gain at more speed and so this is a way that you can do that and so up at the top end here which is this upper adaptation value here um i guess i can draw it your upper adaptation value right now is 210,000 rpm that's the default value i mean uh, that's your bearings would melt and throw 
your flywheel through the yeah you can't ever get that so get that down to like 1800 <laughs> um and that at that value it will be at this scale okay and so you'll scale your gains for your p gain against that so you could set it up on like a flywheel to where this value um where this value at 1800 rpm um instead of a p gain value of 0.3 your p gain if you wanted it to be 0 0.3 uh you could put up you would put this scaling at uh you'd want it to be 10 percent okay and so that would make at 1800 rpm the p gain would equal 0 0.03 i don't know why my pin is messing up so bad maybe it's because i cheaped out on the monitor i think it's uh but so that's what that's what lucid's talking about there with the uh adaptation on the gain that's another way to do it and and it kind of brings up a good point there's depending on what is actually causing these oscillations you may need to do this when you would use the adaptation and not the inertia compensation is if you have some sort of of um like a bearing oscillation you can use this adaptation to if at a high speed um you have like a high speed wobble and as you increase the speed you're wanting to decrease that gain because you you have more of kind of like a, a a wobble in your system like a flexion in your system that's not being caused by uh the change in the set point because there is there is some stuff that like you'll get wobbles at different speeds but it's because you're accelerating and decelerating and that that's like a harmonic thing um which there's a way that you can eliminate stuff out of that too. Uh, but for this, um, is the stream, I'm just looking at the, the statistics and it does not look good right now on this. Yeah, it says it's excellent. Well, um, anyway, so that's what this ad adaptation is. And that's what Lucy was talking about there. Um, let's go through now and kind of finish our thought about where we were going with this. Um, clear this and get out of here. Um, let's go back to this screen. So if we had a fixed inertia, like a a very large roll or something then um this pre-control would work because it's never going to change but we in winder applications we're going to need a depending on where we are in the roll we want to have a different pre-control value and it is set up 100 percent uh, to be able to bring in these additional torques here so you have like this additional torque one, you have the additional torque one scaling, you have additional torque two. So you actually have two different val two different places where you could bring in a custom feed forward set point. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this additional torque one. So let's let's write this down, uh, 1511, all right? I'm gonna try and remember parameter 1511. we're going to go we're going to look at we're going to go back up to let's see uh what do i want to put i want to put put right here so we're back up into our dcc chart and i'm under technology and i want to pull in two different blocks okay to do a diameter calculator actually oh, x out on that one 
because we really want to do this axial winder moment of inertia, <clears throat> right? So what we really want is the moment of inertia for, uh, so that we can do a little bit of math and be able to tie into that additional torque. Now, what is this block? Let's, uh, so we got a question. Could you use P adaptation to reduce speed oscillation at low speed, even when at high speed, the control is perfect? Yes. So that, that is the, the, the kind of trick with the oscillate or the ad adaptation is if you have low speed problems that you need more gain, um, then you can use adaptation. Um, and so there's, I guess you can invert it because you can put in like a 200%. So, um, you, you could invert that logic. If you're needing less gain at the low end, you could put your top end as say 200% and then put in a lower P gain, if that makes sense. Um, so you would just have to, because that scaling factor on your adaptation, uh, is you can go up 200%. You can, it doesn't have to be capped at a hundred. So just kind of think about right now, the, the higher your speed is the lower, if it's set at a hundred, the lower your, uh, your value is going to be. And so you kind of have to invert your logic that when you get up to that higher speed, you would want, um, you would want it to be 200% of the P gain at low at the low speed if that makes sense so it's like that way you could have a lower a lower value at the lower end it kind of inverts it uh, i know that that might be confusing um but yeah so the the p adaptation and you also have integral adaptation too but um the reset time adaptation is is a little bit more of a I guess it's less obvious the effect that it has on it. Uh, and it's more kind of, there's a couple of tuning techniques that, that really can dial in your, at different speeds, the, the reset adaptation. So on this, <clears throat> on this block in, in DCCs, um, I'm going to click, click on it and click F1 and there is a uh, a block or sorry help file that is about all of these that's like built into the DCB editor so it's pretty nice and you have a function block or kind of connection diagram it has descriptions um, really good overview of kind of like what we're going here and you can kind of see the situation that we have here we have a we have a role that is winding that is getting bigger. And so if you are familiar with, with inertia on a roll, it's actually a square power. So like the further you are away from the diameter, uh, or sorry, from the center, the, the inertia is actually, it, it's a, it's a power, it's a square law. It's not a, a doubling. So it's an exponential. So the further you get away, your inertia is going up exponentially exponentially. And so that's why if you're doing like a 10 inch roll, then, uh, or I guess a third of a meter roll, uh, then, then you're going to be, um, you're going to be running into situations that, um, uh, that's yeah, to where your inertia is really going to change. And so that's why this calculation has these parameters to be able to keep up with that changing inertia. Yeah. So one of the things about the P gain values, and we kind of talked about this before those gain values are parameters. And so the only way you would be able to update those parameters. So the actual P values in your expert list, those P values are going to be green is by using what's called acyclic communication. Now, if you wanted to do that in a, um, if you wanted to do that in a uh, PLC, you would have to use a, um, so 
there's a kind of can block that you could use called Sinapera, which I've talked about on another live stream. Or you could kind of build your own thing with a block uh, that's called um, read data record. So it's uh, it's DAT underscore read DAT underscore WR. And there's a bunch of handshaking and stuff that goes back. But yeah, so if you wanted to update that P gain value and that reset time, the integral value, you could do that, but you would have to use the block sign up para in order to update that. And so a little bit of complexity there, but yes, you could absolutely do, do this sort of thing on your PLC and then pass that information back down to it. But the, uh, those gain values kind of, they're not bicos. Um, but we can do this here that we're looking at this changing inertia. And so we're wanting to output a, some value and now i'm going to kind of cut this to where it's not actually exactly right but you'll get the idea of what it would how to connect everything but you can take this block and if you went through and figured out all of the different parameters for it and say okay here's what i here's all of these values we look at it current diameter, material width, material density, scaling factor for density, core diameter, blah, 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 all this stuff. You go through and look at this, this calculation that's all kind of set up here. The output for it is going to be the resulting moment of inertia. So the MOI is going to be some moment of inertia. Now, so that's Newton meters per second square. And so we're going to need to have some sort of acceleration factor in there. Um, so we're going to have to take this output in order to get Newton meters. Um, we're going to have to divide Newton, Newton, Newton meter second square. Okay. So yeah. So um, the output of that is going to need to be divided by our acceleration in, um, in meters per no, Newton meters per second. Newton meters second squared. So, no, second squared. So, yeah, we're going to have to figure out a, a, a multiplier or divide factor for the output of this block. But, essentially, what we will be doing is taking the output of this block and connecting it into our, um, that additional torque one, that, that uh, P1511. So we can do that one of two ways. If we know we are always going to, when we use this block, connect it to parameter 1511, we can go connection to interconnection address and then drive one and then go down to 1511 and then click okay. And it connects it over to parameter 1511. Now, if we go back out here and then Oh, let me actually bring it up here. Compile this chart. And two errors. What did we get? Just interconnected with Bico must be published. Oh, it's interesting. So what happened is remember we have to publish these. Even though we have this, uh, we have to go through and make it some sort of um at uh star 15 we have to make it a bico we have to publish it because otherwise it won't work um so even if we have that kind of like establishment there we know that it's always going to be connected set that and compile blam there we go and it is connected so if we were to build up this dcc chart it would come in we would accept it and compile it and then it would connect it all up and it's good to go. As long as nothing was already used in that additional torque. <laughs> so probably a better way of doing it would be to make that a bico and then not connect it over and make it kind of customizable. So that way, if for some reason you try to use your fancy block on, uh, you import it into your buddy's program 
and you're like, hey, I've got this awesome chart that I've made, and you load it up, and then you go to compile it, it doesn't like break its program. <laughs> uh, and so let's let's go over and look at this. And instead of doing this interconnection here, let's just, uh, oops, sorry. Let's just right click, delete that interconnection and just leave that the same, okay? And, and it's a subtle difference. And again, remember, we're gonna need to multiply this by something, like uh, some, some factor. And it might be that we're bringing in some value from somewhere else in order to get a Newton meter. Cause right now our units aren't right. And if, yeah, <laughs> you've been an engineer very long, you're looking to going into engineering, you're just trying to learn units really matter. Like basically if the units aren't right, then you're wrong. <laughs> like that, that's what it is right now. Our units are the units of this MOI are in, uh, uh, inertia units. They're not in torque units, but the torque units are really close. They're in Newton meters. And so we need to get a, a per second square from somewhere. So I didn't prepare for that and I'm not smart enough to know it on, 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 uh, on the fly, uh, breaking the, the curtain. But so all we do, all we've done here is just publish this and we go back into starter and we're gonna accept and compile and we are going to bring that down a little bit and again if you notice these are gone now so they've went back to default but if we go into our expert list actually let's not even go to our expert list let's stay where we were work set points right so say there was something here i don't know what it would be and we wanted to use, instead of using that additional torque one, we want to use additional torque two. We could just click on additional torque two, further interconnections, scroll all the way down to the bottom, and there is our parameter. Again, it's the wrong units. <laughs> and it's, it's yelling at you that it's the wrong units because you can see here, these units are in Newton meters, and this is saying it's in Newton meters, Newton meters second squared. So you got to divide by a, a second squared somewhere. Um, but let's, so that, that is a, um, yeah. So that, how we would connect it in to that inertia. Now we could refine this a little bit because if you go through and look at, at this function, it doesn't actually have any way to, to determine, uh, how fast it's coming in. It, it's only looking at the current diameter. So this is, this is calculating the inertia of a cylinder of a certain diameter. Well, our diameter is changing, right? And so that's where this other block that comes in that kind of goes together is the input for this is the current diameter, but we don't have that because it's changing. So what we can do is bring in this other block, a diameter calculator. And again, these are the core of all winding center winding center winding inertia type systems because you're it's, it's building up and your torque is changing. And so there's another thing about this as well is that as this diameter builds up, your torque just in and of itself, your linearized speed is going to be, so one RPM is gonna be speeding up. So if you wanna linearize your speed by the center feed, you have to do this diameter calculator too. So there's a lot of stuff that if you're doing center feed winders that there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, and so here's a couple of tools. So the output of this, we can click on it and click F1, or if you had a sharp eye, you saw that it was in this same thing, diameter calculator right here. But um, we have all this other, other stuff here um, 
that you can like bring in and this this block's a little bit more complex it's got a, a little bit more stuff in it but um a little bit about just kind of the way it is is that um it's going to take in oh do we have any german speaking people in here <laughs> uh yeah so that that image is in german um uh, but it, it's basically going to take in the uh diameter is going to be this it's going to calculate the circumference and then from the speed and it's going to take a thickness of the the material and diameter and it's going to build up the diameter based on that and and it tells you this calculation here um and then there's because you have you're bringing in a speed your speed's not going to be perfect right because you're probably going to want to bring in the actual speed you're not going to want to bring in the set point speed because guess what your your actual speed may not be the set point so it's really tempting to bring in the set point speed and say oh that's super smooth and so it's going to be real nice but then this inertia calculation is going to be way off because your diameter calculation is going to be way off um so there's a couple the core to this is that you're going to bring in your your actual line speed or i guess your actual motor speed if you have a gear ratio information in there as well um and yeah go go from that so let's see da, 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 da. let's look at the block diagram here so line speed motor speed it's capped okay so he's got revolutions yeah da, 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 da. so yeah so essentially what you're doing is oh yeah like a linear line speed and it's going through the uh gear ratio at least that's what it looks like x yep and then that's going to be your linearized speed okay so yeah it looks like there there's going to be um either a motor speed because you're dividing by like yeah so there is a little bit of complexity in this block but just know for the most part that you're bringing in a speed and taking the thickness of your paper and wrapping it along wrapping it around your drum and building up a diameter so the output of this the d output is going to be the input to that inertia block and so then you got to know stuff about your paper blah 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 all that stuff um so yeah so let's just kind of just roughly connect up this stuff so we know that our output d is going to be this d here and it's going to connect in there and then we know that um we want our motor speed right well do we want that coming from an encoder do we want that coming from a um like the calculated speed, so like our R63, do we want it like, where do we want it coming from? Well, why not just make it variable, right? So we go in here and we're gonna, we're gonna call this, uh, so we're gonna call this at star 20 because I don't remember what my numbers were. Um, come in here and we're just going to leave it like that uh and so we really have an input and an output we've tied this moi so the moment of inertia which again the wrong units so it's not right um and so now we're going to come back out to starter and um yeah so we're going to come in here and accept a compile and in our we can do this one of two ways so we'll go back to expert list uh again if you've made it this far into the video or you're just coming in uh be sure to hit that like on the video it gets it out there it gets more people involved and the next time it's fun having more people in here chatting uh it's been a great great stream great international stream i love it um and so 
Yeah, so what we have now is we have this parameter motor speed. And so right now it's set to 100, which that doesn't seem right. But we can either go here and we can put in values such as R63. So, and we have a couple of different values here. Do we want it the smooth value? Do we want it the unsmoothed value? I don't know. You caught kind of in the block uh, before there's some smoothing parameters in the block. If you're not using that those, then maybe you want to use this smooth value. If you are using the the smoothing values in the block, all right, maybe we go with the unsmooth. I'll just go with R630 for this because that is the system actual speed. And where that shows up is in the speed controller. Okay, that is R63. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> uh, there it is. See, I told you, it was right here on this screen. Exactly where I said it the first time. <laughs> uh, so R63, that is kind of your system feedback. Um, obviously, here's a couple of, there's a set point filter and then a, a smoothing that you can bring in. But because we set it up to be by, um, by FICO, then that is done. One thing I will point out, um, see if this is right. If you notice when we compiled that block, because it wasn't automatically interconnected, we're gonna have to go back through and connect this back up to our uh, 15, but a resulting moment of inertia. So, so whenever you compile the block, if you don't have it tied to like hard line into the output, it will, undo it it'll un it'll bring those all the values that it's connected to all the bico parameters will go back to their default um so just make sure most of the time you're going to go through and you're going to develop these and maybe maybe as a word of advice when you're if you're developing a block like this go through and when you're testing and you know you're going to be like compiling Go ahead and use the actual interconnection to addresses and pick those directly and test that way so you're not having to remember to go because this would get annoying like re really annoying um and so go through and and yeah while you're testing hardwire everything but then when you go to actually complete your block that you're going to want to use later on down the road then that's when you would go through and delete all those interconnections and there's still, they still have to be Bico. And then you go through and compile it one last time and then go through and set all your connections up again for one last time and then do it that way. That way um, you're not having to remember to, to set all of this stuff back up. Um, wow. So we have gone two hours on just DCCs. I guess here, I, I don't think we're going <laughs> to, I've got work. I've got, I've got to do this afternoon. It's, it's, uh, I've got to run a business. <laughs> uh, so I will show you one thing still in DCCs. I want to say, are they in here? Uh, wobble generator line of carry. So we're kind of talking about, uh, writing, two parameters um reading drive parameters writing drive parameters that's still required the same way you would do it with a plc there's still a block on in dccs that you have to use in order to actually write a p value so if that parameter value is in green you have to uh, use this write drive parameter so right drive parameter real type. So if you want to write, say like your motor data, <laughs> like your, or your, uh, motor speed, something like that, you have to use these. Um, so this WRP, um, but yeah, so you still, cause there, there'd be no way to publish into a block. You still have to use these values to, to, to bring in a parameter value. Um, 
And there's also a couple of other little things too. Um, what was it? There's a couple of other little things that you might find that you're not able to maybe a value is in the wrong the wrong type and you're wanting to bring it into a multiplication there's some there's some conversion blocks here just like you have in um in portal and just kind of all these functions and so yeah yeah feel free to ask a couple questions i'm hang out for just a, a minute or two more i'm I was going to talk about PIDs in, um, I guess we could do that. Y'all, if y'all have any more questions, I'm going to be on, on this other screen getting, uh, let's see, getting portal tied up. We kind of just chat for a little bit and I'll, I'll bring up the, the con C, the, the constant parameter thing, because we'll talk a little bit about PIDs in, really the S7 300s and 400s. Um, so let's see, let me get over onto camera. How are y'all doing? Yes, it's, it's a good day. Um, so let's move, if we don't have any more questions about uh, DCCs, we may go into some more in-depth stuff. I have a, um, I have something that I wanna do and for y'all that are on here, I'm wanting to see if I can make a, um, a DCC chart that, uh, compensates for a, a fixed spring wobble. So I first, and this is about the only way that I, I could think to describe it, um, was that, um, I had this project that I was working on one time that it was a, a, a pop-up kind of like defense gate. And these are like used at like military bases and things like that. They're, they'll be like down in the road and like they'll see, see somebody come in and they're like, um, I don't think that person's going to stop. And so it'll like, and like pop up and it'll like pop up out of the ground. And, um, this, company was trying to replace their um their hydraulic actuator with electric actuation and in order to do it they had to have this like quick ramp up like emergency deploy time it had to be like one and a half seconds or something like that and i'm like okay yeah one and a half seconds for it, it was a it was a linear actuator it it wasn't a xlar it was a elix E W I L I X L L I X something like that. Ewelix. <laughs> Hank. All right. My my southern accent has a problem with that word. <laughs> so that company it was a linear actuator. So it just had a motor and a ball screw kind of like inside the uh, this housing, um, and powering it with the S one twenty, and I'm like, okay, there's, it's only like 500 millimeters a stroke or something like that, 100 millimeters. It, it was something very achievable in a second and a half. And I was like, I bet you I can do it in half a second. And, and they're like, nah, you can't do it in half a second. That's just, it's not physically possible for the thing to extend that fast. And I'm like, like what? <laughs> yeah, it is. And sure enough, I, I could, absolutely do it like just whip it up and like pop it up like so fast it could like if you were standing on top of it it would throw you across the room but the problem when it popped up is it had this like wobble <laughs> like when it popped up and it would come up so fast it would go boing and like go up and so my thought because you could trace out the torque on it and you could absolutely see that the oscillation, it would be up and then kind of go down like that. You could absolutely see that in the torque. And so what I was thinking would be like, man, you could take these DCC charts and use kind of like what we talked about today and inject a declining sine wave uh, function 
to offset that torque. Because if you knew, just like if you know the acceleration, that that's a that's a constant spring. It, it's a constant spring constant that you would be able to counter using these GCC charts. And guess what functions they have sine and cosine functions built into the DCC libraries. And so all that is, is just a real, a pretty simple sine wave to be able to do. And then you could adjust it over. So I'm going to have to make, I'll have to make a gate. I'll have to make some sort of test system that simulated that. And if I can do that, I promise you, we will do that on stream and we will fight through that and we will do some cool stuff with it, but I have to make a system. But, all right, so I have got, um, I have got portal pulled up. Isn't it pretty? So we are gonna talk real quick about, and I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm like, I realize I don't, will it even let me pull this block in on the fifth, on a 1500 PLC? I didn't even think about that. I may have to put in a 300 PLC. No, I did it in portal. Uh, no, nah, I tested this. This comes in. So this technically is not for the 1500. This block is for your 300s and 400s. And while I'm using portal, you can absolutely use this function in step seven, five, five. Or oh, I guess it's five, six is the Windows 10 version. So five, six, you can use this in, in in somatic manager um so this pid control pid basic functions yeah can't see so this continuous controller i'm just going to pull in a main right now and i'll go ahead and tell you that main is not the place to bring this in but Tell you where it needs to be here in a second. There's a reason I'm pulling it in main. So here is a PID controller. And if you're not quite familiar with PID, I did a segment, um, segment on kind of like what a PID controller is trying to do. And, um, yeah, there's a live stream on it. It's about an, uh, probably 45 minutes or so of me talking about what, what's kind of the point of a PID controller, but this is a version of of it that is available in um that's available in all all versions of a processor but originally this is what you would have to use on a 300 or 400 processor because your uh pid compact blocks are not available in they're only available in uh 1500 so these guys over here can you see those no you can't <laughs> my head's blocking it y'all aren't yelling at me my head's blocking <laughs> Seriously, y'all gotta y'all gotta yell at me when my head is blocking the screen. Uh, but yeah, so the Kotsi is down. The continuous controller is in the PID basic functions. Um, if you're using a 300 or 400 processor, this is available. The PID compact, PID three step, these are not available in the threes and four hundreds. Uh, they are only available in the uh, 1500s, I believe. It might even. I mean, they might be in the 1200, but anyway, we're talking about continuous controllers, PID function. Let's click on it. I clicked on it and then hit F1. And just to have our, the funk or the help file pulled up because we're going to talk about a couple of things in this. It's getting pulled up on the screen below and I'll show you this. Um, so this is what it comes up when you when you just hit F1. Um, and so how continuous controller works, the block diagram, all this stuff. And so what what we really want to do is we're gonna look at the block diagram. And again, we're not gonna go into what all a PID controller and everything is, just we kind of talked about it just a little while ago about the P side of it is like how angry it is, how fast it's gonna react when it's not getting its way. Um, and you can kind of think of the integral component of it as being uh, a, a more kind of like laid back version is if there's an error for a long time, then that integral component is going to build up. And so that's two components of, of um, a 
PID is the PI. The derivative is actually how fast is it changing? So if it's kind of like, oh crap, this thing, my set or my actual value is changing really quickly. So the derivative value is going to counter for that quickly. So it's going to be more derivative in that. So that's derivative is can get you into trouble because if you don't have a stable system, you can really quickly get into an unstable system. And so if you don't know how to tune a derivative, don't use it. <laughs> like it it's, or I guess test on something that, that if it breaks, uh, you're not going to use a, you're not going to lose your life <laughs> or your job. Uh, just saying that way. So, cause derivative derivative can get really wild on this. So anyway, this block diagram, you see, we have a, um, I'm going to bring this down on to the sketch pad so that I can write on it. Uh, sketch pad. And my face is in the way now. Ooh, that is not what I wanted. Click me. Move me. All right. So what we have is, let me get down here. Um, our, we have our actual value, our process value can either be in some sort of units or we have our process value in percent. So the process value is going to be your actual value. So whatever your feedback is, so if you're doing pressure, you're trying to control the pressure on this, this is going to be in, um, that's going to be your feedback. So that's going to be coming from your pressure sensor. So your set point is going to be, so your set point is going to be um, whatever, if you're trying to control it to um, like 100 PSI. Again, Imperial units, sorry, I'm a redneck. Um, but if your set point, you're trying to set it to 100 PSI and that's what you're trying to control, then that's gonna come in here. Now, is that set point in percent or is it in uh gosh get my hands messing this up or is it in real units and if it's in real units then you'll use this one if it's in percent you will use this one as your feedback and you will want to scale your feedback either according to percent or according to real units. So that's what that's what that is. I personally like to do everything in percent in my block. So my block always gets percents. And so the output is a percent. My inputs, they're all percents. And then I scale them outside the block. That's personally how I like to do it. But there are uh, normalization and scaling in here um, on this block. But I'm not going to talk about them. So essentially what you're bringing in is a set point, a uh, feedback value, and then you are outputting, uh, you are outputting, oh, where is it? Da, 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 da. Yeah, either a percent or a real value out of it. Now, one thing to note about this block and, um, so your LMN is, is kind of a, the real value or your percent is going to be a normalized value. Um, one of the things to, to understand about this block is that this output is outputting a change value. And so this is a very very important thing to know about this block is that if this 
if you have this going as like a speed set point to a drive and this value is going to be like two or three percent sometimes like at steady state this value is always going to be at two or three percent if you think about it so what can happen you can do it one of two ways this controller is always trying to balance something out or you can say i want to you enter in like your speed set point as like a um so 100 psi and so as it the speed set point starts off at zero and then you are constantly wanting to add your speed set point plus this L M N value because at zero, it's going to be like, all right, the L M value is going to go up pretty quick and that's how, how it's going to work. And so, but then once you get it dialed in, it'll come up and, and dial out. So you cannot put this L M N straight to your drive speed set point. It has to be an, an addition or a subtraction. Otherwise it's going to be unstable. Okay. So just know that, that you have to do something like this speed plus speed set point plus LM, LMN. And I'll show you how to do that. Let's, let's hop over to the, the portal screen. So get this off there and then go bottom left. Yep. Uh, no, let's go bottom right. Go over here. Um, so here, the output of this block, for example. Tell you what. Yeah. So the output of this block is going to be um, LMN. Tell you what. We're good Siemens programmers, aren't we? I know you are. I can be a little sketchy sometimes. So let's let's make a, a function call because I want to move the, all of this stuff around a little bit and I want to have some temp values and stuff. And so let's make a function call for this and call it PIDFC. Uh, like this, automatic, cool. We're going to say okay. Now, I'm going to take what we just had I'm going to rip that out. Control X. Come here. Control V. And I just hit Control. Okay. All right. So, because what I want to do is I want to take this value and I want to do a little adder block. Right? They're going to, whoo, did stuff way too fast. All right. <laughs> Add. Uh, and I want to take this LMN value here and then add it to like some speed set point uh, that's somewhere else. So what I can just do is I can just make a temp value here called temp LM. And that. And it, what is this? I'm gonna hover over this and it's gonna tell me, what is this value? <laughs> hover. So it's a real, okay. So it needs to be a real. Okay. Do that. And then now I could use this temp. And then somewhere else I have a set point. Oh, oh look at that. So we've got this drive set point already set up. Then we're going to do like this. It's almost like I did another video on PID and used the same program. Oops. Uh, yeah. So that sort of thing that we have here is actually what, what we do. And so like here, our uh, blah, blah, blah. 
Yeah. So there's two things. That's the basics. And that's kind of very similar to the, what we were doing with uh, the other PID. But there's a couple of things that, that we would need to talk about on this um, before we actually could use it. Because the first thing was that this output is just going to be hopefully a small value at steady state. It should never be like going up and down, like, because the closer it, the closer this, the feedback gets to the set point, the smaller this block will be all the time. So that's the first thing. That's why you have to do this whole thing with the, the add the drive set point to the set point and, and to the LMN, because you're taking, you're, you're taking and, and using this block and, just kind of like moving anyway that's why you got to do that second thing is this block has to be called in a very timely fashion so timely because it has an integral it has to know how long it has been in between times and that is this cycle input okay so right now this function call is not being called okay if we put it into main, it doesn't really matter how we call it. It's always gonna change. Like it, our cycle time is gonna change all the time. So if we want this to be a T pound 100 milliseconds, okay? There's two ways of doing this. We can either set up in front of this block a 100 millisecond IEC timer, or we can use a cyclic function or cyclic OB that is, will get called every 100 milliseconds. I prefer the second way because even an IEC timer, it's a hundred milliseconds. Yeah, it would be fine, but you can get these down into like, I think one millisecond or something like that, I think is the minimum for this. And an IEC timer if your if your cycle time is less than your IEC timer, your your resolution on your IEC timer is only going to be as fast as your your cycle time. So if your cycle time is ten milliseconds, uh, then you can only actually even though you're saying a hundred milliseconds, it might be a hundred ten milliseconds uh, before you can actually you actually read it. Anyway, so let's go through. I'm going to delete this because again. I'd forgotten that I'd use this when I was preparing for this. I'd forgotten that I'd use this block for um, the other PID talking about talking about the portal version of this. But so what we're going to do is we're going to go in and oops, add a new block. Now we're going to do PID 100 and it's an OB. We're going to do a cyclic interrupt. And again, this cycle time in portal is a thousand microseconds or sorry, a hundred thousand it's in microseconds. So this is 100 milliseconds, right? The so microseconds, the, the, the milliseconds, hundred. Okay. So this is a hundred milliseconds. Now, if I open this up and I now call my, just drag my PID FC in here. Good to go it's good to go pretty simple um but the same the same method is in um is in um somatic manager i just don't have the somatic manager projects for this the i mean i mean really you're pulling the same blocks in they're named the same thing they're the same parameter or the same functions they're the same um uh you're, you're doing the same thing and the the block the cyclic interrupt is the biggest thing and even in even in somatic manager you make a new block call new block cyclic interrupt you select it and and you you do all the parameters just just the same so and that's all under the properties of the block so right click um right click object properties or i think it's alt enter click on it alt enter and it brings up ob object properties of the block and you can set the uh the um uh, 
interrupt on that. But yeah, I mean, honestly, there's the biggest difference between um, kind of your the two blocks is the fact that you have um, oops you have these different functions here um, so there's really not too a too whole lot I mean we can look at the different inputs here um, so I guess there there is a little bit about the the com restart um, instruction so the instruction has an initialization routine that is processed when the restart input is set. So uh, part of that is if you're using the integral component, if any time that you shut off the, um, shut off the, I guess, either manual control or any anything that your drive is, this PID function is not able to accurately affect the motor, you want to reset you want you want this to be off if so if you go into some sort of manual mode you want that to be off if you want if you go uh to disable the drive you want to disable this com this com reset because when it comes on it zeros out the integral which is very important especially if you have like a long uh settling time system uh that integral component can build up and normally it's not supposed to build up very fast but if you've if it's been sitting there and building up building up building up you, you won't like the the results of it <laughs> uh, so one thing to talk about the the gain values so the integration time um so your minimum integration time is going to be the cycle time at your input so the cycle and that this cycle input here um remember that's the sampling time that's not that's actually how often it is being updated and so the fastest you can do it is one millisecond it has to be greater than or equal to one millisecond that's what this is saying here um, if you have, say, um, a one millisecond update time, this integration time can be as low as one millisecond. Integration time can be thought of as the time that you are giving the controller to correct for the error. And so if you don't give someone a lot of time on an assignment, they are going to panic. Um, and so, and they're going to have to be like, go really fast and really crazy. So the bigger, the number of your integral time, the smaller the action is. So the bigger, the number, the less panic your controller will have if there's an error. So the smaller, the number, the more panic there is because you have less time to act. So remember, remember that portion of it. Um, uh, da, 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 da. There's so there's built-in dead band, which is pretty cool. The PID compact doesn't have this. This has a lot more features. The PID compact that we talked about on, on the other PID thing uh, is that. So uh, yeah, so this, this function has been around for decades. And so the big, the big thing, those like the, the most common misconceptions is the output has to be added. Like if you're a drive set point, you can't use it as a drive set point. You have to add it to some drive set point because this is always going to be, it should be a small number. And as you get closer to your, your um, variable, or as you get closer to your set point, that will, will change. And if you, try to plug this to a set point it'll always be oscillating it'll never be stable um and the second part tie it into a uh, a object block so a a cyclic 
like PID, like an OB30. Um, and again, this is in Portal. Same concept in uh, Somatic Manager 5.6. I mean, that doesn't have to be 5.6. You could be using like 5.3. You could be using something older. But uh, Somatic Manager, same thing. Um, and the last thing, I guess, would be to understand, everybody kind of intuitively understands the proportional. The bigger the error, the bigger the bigger the panic. Um, and so the integral portion, the smaller the number that you're putting in on the input, the bigger the panic. So you're getting less time on your assignment. Um, and so the bigger the number, the longer the time you have on an assignment to get it done. And I will say this controller is not like us, or at least I was like in college. And, you know, the more time you give, the less panic and you still wait till the last minute <laughs> to do it and then you panic. Uh, yeah, it's not like that. It takes and and does it over the whole time. But anyway, yeah, so really that that's it. And I know that this is a lot of drive channel stuff and I, I've, I get... I get these questions coming from the PLC side and, and I love to, I love to, to talk to the, the PLC people too, as well. Cause I understand that there's a lot more people that, that deal with the PLC side and can get more out of a simple conversation about uh, a PID block. Um, they're just not, not as fancy, I guess. Um, but I mean, the thing about it is like the speed controller in, in our drives, I mean, it is a PI controller. And so to understand the gains, you really need to understand what's going on. And there's kind of no no greater way than to, to work with a, a PID block like this. And it's really, so I guess for that to say, like if you really want to understand how to control a drive, uh, maybe find find a reason to have a project to where you can use a PID controller to control like a pump and try to control pressure from a pump because that really will take you to the next level in your programming and your understanding of systems because you will understand oh hey in order to affect my pressure I need to affect flow in order to affect flow I need to affect my uh speed and you realize that you have these embedded loops that kind of like they're um what are those dolls it's not babushka um the dolls inside dolls um but yeah so those sorts of so those sorts of things oh yeah yeah see if um with the the hardware i i definitely want to get some hardware connected. The issue I have here is my wife would kill me. <laughs> uh, because I'm in my apartment. You may you may know that this is not actually a brick wall. <laughs> I'm sitting in my, my spare bedroom in my uh, apartment in Atlanta, in downtown Atlanta. So my shop has all of our equipment in it. And so my shop is about 300 miles away. Um, I may start, I may be able to do some live streams from the shop and that would be where I would be able to bring in more hardware because I already am walking the line with how much stuff I have <laughs> in my spare bedroom. Uh, my wife is very patient with me, but uh, yeah, I can't bring much more in. I got a new 3D printer over here and that might that might be trying our marriage. <laughs> Not really. I just have to print her like flowers first on it. I think that's I think that's what I'm going to do. Um but seriously, I I where I can, um I will try to bring in hardware. Um and so like I have I have like a little 1200 rack that I have hidden under one of my shelves right here and and I have a, I have a control unit that, that I, I can, I don't have to have a physical drive, um, but to, to kind of like do the DCC and like show all the graphs and show all the stuff. But, but I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you, see if it, it, it's, I, I like to see it, see it work and see it go. 
Um, and so, yeah, there's only so much you could do, like, like simulating and, and doing that. And like where you get your most experience is, is working with something. And those few times, like that, if you can get a company that's like starting up a piece of equipment and you can get ahead of the electricians or the, you can like, usually the electricians are always behind the, the mechanical people and the mechanical people take all of the time. And it's like, Oh, this needs to start up on the, on January 20th and, and come around and like the mechanics are being completed on January 15th. And you're like, come on. <laughs> So if you could ever get a project to where, oh, you have an extra week to be able to like really learn this stuff. That's, that's, that's the, like the blessings. And so I guess we've got a couple of projects that are, that are coming up that I think I might be able to, to be able to spend some time with real hardware. Um, but if not, um, we've got a bunch of stuff in our shop that I think I could put some put some equip demo equipment together. I'll just have to maybe, maybe do like a Wednesday live stream or something like during the week. And when I'm down at the shop, um, so, but yeah, I, I love working with the stuff. I like hearing the motors and, um, watching it go. Um, so I will try to, I will try to do that with you guys. And yeah, um, I gotta get to work. It's, man <laughs> it's it's almost three o'clock here um and yeah i love i love hanging out and doing this sort of stuff but i gotta literally pay bills uh so yeah i get an extra day because today is a is a holiday uh in in the u.s but the 15th i gotta pay some bills um before tomorrow but but yeah i have appreciated um this this kind of like talk yeah and yeah anytime anytime y'all can join in um we'd love it and comments and talking back and forth and we're trying to build a community of of engineers that are and when i say engineers it doesn't take a degree to be an engineer uh it takes someone that wants to improve a process it wants um sour x Ooh, that's I actually have some sour X on a, on a, uh, a, uh, a, a project. And currently we need to test it. <laughs> I may have to do that. We, I might, I might do a live stream from an actual, um, an actual machine that has, that has sour X on it. Um, or I guess it's C where X everything's C, right? C Siemens C where X. Um, I actually have, I have a machine that I need to, uh, tune in some weighing modules. <laughs> so that might be a really good one. That, that, that would be like stacks on stacks, but I would have to figure out how to make that work because they would be running production while I'm, <laughs> I'm testing it. So yeah. Um, but yeah, if this channel is for you guys. And while I enjoy loving, I, I, I love hearing myself talk and, uh, I really, I really like seeing the community that we're building the, the international community. And I think that, that Siemens brings that, that flavor to it even more. Um, and so, yeah, I will try to get a little bit more, more like real world stuff coming in, but yeah, I, I appreciate everyone that joins. And if you have made it this far and, please like the stream. If you're not subscribed, subscribe. And if you want to join in the next time, um, ring the bell and get that notification. And I think there's like, was it like receive push notifications or something? And yeah, join in either on your phone, on your desktop. If it's during the week, during work, um, just have it playing in the background. I promise if, if your boss, if your, if your boss gets mad at you for watching this at work, um, just let me know and I'll, I'll send you a cer certificate saying that, that like, uh, you're actually learning and it's not just watching random YouTube videos. So, uh, 
Zipper Tech. Man, you have got all. Are you from mining? <laughs> are you? All right. Uh, Maka, seriously, are you? Are you, how are you bringing up all of these things uh, that are from like the mining community? That's what I want to know. You've got to be a coal miner. Uh, Zipper Tech relays and Cyware X modules. That's some heavy duty stuff. And and yes. Uh, so Saif, as far as a WhatsApp group, I have a Discord channel that, or a desk, Discord group that, um, let's see, let me get the, kind of our, let's, let me get the, the code for it. Um, and just kind of, uh, da, 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 let me find this on here. Um, we do have a Discord. I'll probably like put it into, into the, uh, comments on this uh, the tissue industry wow uh so different than the uh coal mining industry but yeah we use we use um Simpertec relays in in coal mining and that's crazy and so yeah i could i could do something with that and it would probably be the only video out on Simpertec relays uh but uh, yeah, I will get I'll get the Discord, I'll get the Discord in the in the comment section, and we can get that going. I'd love to love to do that, um, because yeah, I have a on our website I have a forum that that's kind of for our customers, that is just kind of like a repository for information specific to our projects. Um, but I kind of a little bit more casual back and forth uh, communication would be. Um, would be yeah uh on on the discord uh more s120 yeah i don't think y'all understand how much i love s120s i've i got um i got accused when i was a application engineer of of being a little bit too interested <laughs> in s120s there's some really cool applications with with the the s120s um that you probably wouldn't even think about. Um, there's like some applications that are using, um, like to create gen sets for uh, remote, like oil drilling platforms um, or wind. Uh, I helped with a, I helped, I helped with an application where they had like a, a, a small wind generator and it was with an S120 system and it was just, it was an S120 system with an active line modules. Um, but um, yeah, they brought in, they had a windmill that was sitting there turning and coupled in off of that onto a, a permanent magnet motor and generated with the active line module, three phase power for the, the oil derrick, like out in the middle of nowhere. And so, you can do a lot with S120. I didn't even I didn't even talk about the built-in function on the S120 today. And I'm just going to mention it just right as I get off and say like mention it and then leave. Uh, but there actually is a moment of inertia estimator in S120 that when you turn it on, it creates a parameter that um, every time you accelerate and decelerate, it takes and and it's doing kind of that the calculation that I kind of talked about how to like up your pre-control a little bit and then look at the 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 uh, speed controller output and all of that stuff and it goes through and when it accelerates it calculates the inertia and then you can take that inertia value and put it into a feed forward the feed forward inertia system and then when it goes to decelerate, it already knows, oh, hey, the, here's the value. So like if you have, we used it in a, um, in like a cast iron pipe application to where it would chuck up different pipes, different sizes pipes, and then it would speed it up and then coat the pipe with uh, concrete or whatever, whatever process. They had like a polyurethane outer thing and it would, 
it would speed up slowly and then as it sped up it would calculate the the inertia of the of the system and then it would spray the spray on the outside of it and then it would calculate that inertia and then say okay i'm gonna feed that in and then when it went to decelerate it could decelerate faster because it had that uh that feed forward into it so the s120s are, are crazy cool um but yeah i'm revealing my nerddom but yeah i'm gonna have to go i'm gonna have to get back and get back to the real world and business and doing paperwork and calls and <laughs> but anyway yeah we will get into the heavy topics uh i i love the deep end so but until then yeah if you haven't subscribed you know what to do subscribe we've got some edited videos coming out too my wife is my wife does the editing on the videos and she's been putting a lot of effort in, into some stuff a little bit of fun on it uh a little bit of not taking myself seriously uh <laughs> man yeah i can't i can't go on we'll do it we'll save it for next week uh but yeah be looking out for that that edited video coming out but thank you for all for joining that that have joined and uh that continue to support this channel and continue to grow you're at the base we're almost at a thousand subs um and so which is awesome uh that's all on you guys thank you so much and again hit that like if if you've enjoyed it um and i will talk to y'all next time and yeah y'all have a great uh a great week and keep learning and if you have questions during the meantime find a video and just drop a comment on it i'll talk to y'all later peace